and welcome to Trailer Talk TV. Today we've got Michael Sullivan in the office. Mike, thanks for coming in. Pleasure. Today we're talking about identity. It's a huge issue in the industry. As we know, Apple and Firefox and Internet Explorer and Chrome are attacking the third party cookie. We as an industry depend on it, uh, for a lot of things, tracking, uh, frequency capping, measurement, but these things are now going out the window because third party cookies will become useless. So we need a solution. So Mike's coming in here to talk about some of the stuff the index is working on. And Mike, before we jump on the, on the whiteboard, let's talk about the current state of play. It is a nightmare out right there for third party cookie tracking. Yeah, I mean, third, per, third party cookies were you know, never perfect. Um, but even with a substandard solution, it, it's only getting worse. There's huge sources of inventory for publishers that have no addressability because they're completely cookie-less. Like and Safari. Safari is, is a good example for sure. And that's only increasing. So how can publishers start to introduce addressability back into the equation while also making sure that publisher or, or that users have a little bit more control than mm. they have had in the past? Because there's certainly been a lot of these articles where it's like, you know, publisher, uh, this big news publisher has 25 different trackers running on the site. And... That is like a kind of a scary headline, but if you actually dig in, those 25 trackers are just all these different legacy user sync calls trying desperately to hold this, this old school, old world, third party cookie world together. Mm. And, you know, I think there's a, a bunch of new ways and, you know, constraints can really sort of lead to some interesting innovation. And, but I think like that whole world is just like literally not to overuse the analogy, but just crumbling. <laughs> the cookie is crumbling indeed. Yeah. So there is a solution, like all good, all good ideas in ad tech, it's a elegant solution. So we are here today to talk about this, right? So there is a way for us to A, respect the laws of the land, uh, work within the ITP restrictions, and respect the user at the same time. So That's let's, right. Let's talk about it here, because you've, you've done a nice little sort of graphic here on the, Perfect. on the board here. Yeah. Okay, great. So let me walk through, as a consumer, like as a user on a site, what this actually looks like. So here's me, and I'll just add like some more red hair to sort of illustrate <laughs> that this is this well, is. Well, we're me. two gingers yeah, here, yeah. so it's fine. That's right. Um, so... <laughs> the, the universe is going to combust if they were in the same room. <laughs> so here's me on my favorite, you know, on my favorite site. This is uh, TorontoRaptorReport.com. And TorontoRaptorReport.com has a login box. So I log in because I'm going to be visiting the forums and talking about, you know, how we're getting ready for, for game six. The NBA Finals. I shouldn't date this video, actually, yeah, but <laughs> they're gonna win anyway. Yeah. So, so, um, so I log in with my email address, and this little div right here on this form where I go to log in, you can see here has my email address inputted into it. But if we take this email address and hash it, which is basically um, a mathematical or cryptographic uh, one-way function, which is a fancy way of saying we take this email address, and we turn it into a string of letters and numbers, um, we can use this for uh, identity while still respecting the user's privacy around their email. So when we hash it, let's just say it turns into this string, and it starts with XYZ, it's probably like 120 different characters, and it ends with ACD. So on the Raptor report, the Toronto Raptor report is actually using the Index Exchange Wrapper Library. And so what happens here is now that we've converted in sort of step one, we've converted this into a hash, the email address into a hash. The next step is that the live ramp real-time identity adapter is live on this particular publisher's uh, wrapper library. So the next step here is two, we call live ramp and we call live ramp with a parameter of this hash. And you can see it starts with XYZ and it ends with ACD. This goes over to live ramp and it actually goes into their graph. And LiveRamp looks up in their graph, hey, is there a user here with an email hash that says X, Y, starts X, Y, Z, A, C, D? And they're like, actually we do. And LiveRamp's people-based identifier is called identity link. And so what LiveRamp does is they return this identity link in a form that's heavily encrypted. And what that's referred to as an encrypted envelope. So what happens next is LiveRamp right here returns this envelope of the identity link or IDL. And you can see this identity link envelope is called Batman. So what happens is the wrapper library gets this identity link for Batman returned and it stores it in first party storage down here. 
This is just like when you log into a website and it remembers your preferences for that particular publisher. On Raptor Report, it knows that I wanna have 40 rows or topics per page. It keeps me logged in even after I close my browser. It's the same fundamental concept. It's a first party data for this publisher. So what happens here is that this is now cached, that this identity link envelope called Batman is cached. Then if we sort of go to my next page load on raptorreport.com, you can see up here, the identity library is going to check and say, hey, do you have anything shared or saved in, in first party? And we're gonna say, hey, we actually do. We have this identity link called Batman. So the RTV request to index exchange is now going to, as you can see here, have the identity link attached to the bid request. And this is just a standard bid request that exists across header bidding today. So it functions the same way as a, as a, as a current system in terms of like the transaction. Exactly. Requests. So bid requests and transactions function exactly the same way. There's just an, an, an additional piece of data. So when that comes to index exchange, we actually use LiveRamp's sidecar service to turn Batman, I should stand over here now, to turn, this comes into index exchange and we convert Batman into identity links that are unique to every single DSP. You can see here, uh, Trade Desk has Penguin, you know, Data Zoo has Mr. Freeze, and let's say Media Math has Joker. Then on the bid requests, finally down to the individual DSPs, those bid requests look exactly like they do today. There's nothing special or new, except that they all now have an identity link from LiveRamp attached to their calls. And these DSPs have all been working with Identity Link already, and it's the same ID that they're accustomed to and they've been using before this entire solution was actually uh, realized. So, as I say, nice, elegant uh, solution here. So let's talk. Let's let's get a few questions here, right? So, first of all, um, this piece here, I, I take it if the if the site doesn't recognize this user or like it'll ask for another login. So, this sort of goes back to a couple of things about. Uh, particularly some of the browsers like Safari, right? Mm -hmm. Is it time now, if, if you started using this solution, is it time now to say Safari has to have a login for users because this is the start of it and this is the, this is the way you build the relationship with the Safari? Um, yeah, I think it's how, you introduce, yeah, it's how you introduce addressability into that like cookie-less environment mm -hmm. slash wasteland that you mentioned before. And so you see that in different ways with some publishers uh, utilizing what's called a free wall where it's like, you can't read our content unless you actually provide us your email address, which we can then use maybe perhaps for, for newsletters, um, depending on what's in their privacy policy, but also the ability to take that email address and convert it into a hash. Okay. I think it's also important to note that like what's actually getting transmitted here is just the hash. It's not the actual email address. Of course, and we have to, we have to kind of uh, articulate that because um, it, often, it often gets messed in, the, in, in lost in the soup of, of, of the you know, of the current situation that it's, it's, it's my email, it's my person. This is a non-identifying uh, piece of information. It's not your email. It's not an identifier. Right. It's just a way for, for LiveRamp to work with the publisher in terms of redeeming who's on the site or not. And this goes back to the user experience. How does a the user then control what type of data is, what, what they're exposed in terms of ads? I mean that that's a that's obviously first of mind in, in this process because it's it's we're in a consensual a consent uh, focused uh, world now. So yeah. how does a user sort of say I don't want I want I don't want this type of uh, thing going on in front of me? What, yeah. What, how do I opt that? Yeah. So there's there's three things I would say to that. The first piece is that because the hash is always consistent across uh, a consistent output um, off of my email address, um, I could actually use the hash to opt out. Mm -hmm. So many mechanisms today, whether it be consent or opt out, are all driven by uh, cookie-based IDs. If you were to actually try to effectively uh, opt out on just your phone and your laptop, we have in-app, we have multiple browsers, we have web views with inside apps, you have the browser invite, it's effectively impossible. But if you were to just say, I wanna opt out on this email hash and anytime this email hash or anything that is related to this email hash, you can actually federate that very effectively. Mm. So this same technology and this same methodology also leads to an amazing ability for opt-out purposes as well. So that's point one, I would say. IAB Tech Lab, maybe? 
Uh, I think this is a great idea for the IAB Tech Lab to, to, to invest, and you know, we'd love to talk more about them. I'm sure Dennis will be on the phone later on. <laughs> I think it's, like it's, a very, it's a very powerful mechanism to create a mesh of a user's yeah. opt-out yeah. um, while still respecting that user's privacy. Uh, and then the other piece that I'd say is that's also really, really important is this solution that we went through. The product on our side is called, is called Sonar, Publisher Sonar. And this is only on a per publisher basis. So in this illustrative example, Raptor Report, which is our publisher, has enabled this and has brought addressability to their Safari inventory. Mm -hmm. But what ends up happening is that if I go to my next page, which is, let's say, uh, red flag deals, which is a forum to get like, you, you know, have to log in again. Yeah. I'm, I'm back to, um, unknown traffic. But on the f flip side, if you, if you log in to Raptor report and then the red flag and you log into both, at least the buyer then can see the buyer will always see, see me as frequency, joking. frequency capping, measurement, targeting, the, th the things that both Google and Facebook have an abundance at scale and are, right. uh, and are siphoning more money off the system. Yeah, it's basically publishers, the, myself as a user, I'm in control of which publishers have access to my data, but also buyers have a common ID that they can use, starting with the LiveRamp identity mm -hmm. link. Um, but the same thing is like, I don't log into Raptor Report once and I'm suddenly, quote unquote, tracked everywhere across the web. Okay. Uh, in terms of... In terms of just that was my next question. Does the user have to be logged in everywhere, or is there a way for, like, for instance, if I get an email newsletter and I click on a link, is that is that part of the yeah. process as well? So, so this is the sort of the obvious sort of entry point, I would say, of converting an email to a hash or, or discovering a hash location. There are many different um, entry nodes that we sort of think about uh, in terms of uncovering these these nodes. Another one that you just mentioned is. If I'm a publisher and I regularly send daily newsletters, newsletters are, are really taking off again. They're experiencing a big renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, those are you, you can use those links within those pages that drive back to your site as locations for um, hash uh, emails to be to be actually discovered and used from a, a system like this. Okay. So that's one. Certainly, login pages. We talked about like you know free walls is another one um, when that's sort of like an overlay that pops over the page. Um, there's a, a, a quite a few different like um, like nodes that we're thinking about that can be used to, to source the hash. So this is a first party cookie, right? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a live RAM. I think live RAM have the, the first party cookie on page. Is that right? Yeah, it's and, a, it's the envelope, uh, and it's a it's a first party cookie that yeah that right. rotates. So um, Safari have they wipe third party cookies every every day, every twenty four hours, and then they wipe first party cookies every seven days. Right. So are you not concerned that Apple might just decide to, to kill the first party cookies? Well, I think like what we like about this particular approach um, is that we feel like it operates in harmony with the web and how it was designed. Effectively, I am a consumer and I'm a user of Raptor Report. I logged in and we're basically using the login to accomplish two tasks as opposed to one. Um, and as a consumer, like... I will have a degraded experience if Apple just eliminates first-party cookies. Because you, you were saying that you were saying before we, we came on, sorry, filming that it would be a case of like every time you go on Safari, you have to log into everything again, right? And it would just piss users off, and users go, you know what? There's a far better uh, alternative, right. i.e., i.e., Chrome. Right. Know? If I had to use every time I went to Raptor Report and I was hit with a free wall or a login, and I'm constantly having to do this with the amount of passwords users need to remember and things like that. It's just it, it it's um it's just it creates significant friction where users will begin to explore alternatives. Mm. So that's why I think like this solution operates in harmony with the way the web is designed. This is a first party piece of data related to the experience of the user on this publisher and this publisher only. So how does the publisher get its hash data? Is this so this login right? Mm -hmm. Does it have to be connected to something specific? Does it have to be connected to the live RAM tool? To act, then help you guys. Yeah. Uh, so enable publishers to, uh, to 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 do, to do proper targeting. Right. So I would say two things. Um, the first thing is like it's not connected to Live Ramp. Our technology that sits in the in this particular case, this is the wrapper library that sits yeah. above the publisher, uh, the publisher site in the head section of the publisher's page, has a specific profile that says for Raptor report. 
there's a few locations that we can source these hashes from. So they can say, like, let's say this email is actually called something like div dot login dot raptor report. Yeah. And so now this wrapper library for raptor report has a custom profile that says there are specific divs you need to look for, specific boxes and fields that you can source this hash from. Right. So every publisher has a custom version of this profile that then the system knows where they can source the hash. Because LiveRamp is just is a pipe here, and they're waiting to receive the hash. Yeah, it's all the logic that's actually discovering the hash on a per publisher basis is is unique to the library. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, in terms of sort of the rollout, where are you at right now, or how how are you? Is it beta? In beta, you yeah. work with some some partners so, or yeah. So functions? good question. So right now we are in active development, and we will the beta will be rolling out um, later this summer. We've actually just announced the feature publisher Sonar. Uh, we announced it uh, in LA two weeks ago, and and so we're really excited to just initially bring it to market and start to talk to people about it. The beta is this summer. Um, LiveRamp will be the launch partner in terms of graph support, but we've got a bunch of great graphs integrated into the Index Exchange platform, and we'll be bringing that support for Sonar to all those other graphs as well. Um, so publishers will have a UI, and they will be able to choose, you know, which graphs they want to use within Sonar if they have a special commercial relationship with someone like M1 or, or the Merkle team or what have you, they'll be able to have that flexibility. And this solution really attacks probably one of the, you know, the, the, the two, uh, Facebook in particular. Like, so Google obviously have a very strong search business and search data, but uh, uh, Facebook's entire business re relies on this specific logged in data. Yeah. Because let's be honest, with you, their, their inventory is complete dog shit. Like, so uh, it's their data that matters most, yeah. it's their graph that matters most. So they, if we can get this scaled, Yes, the premium publishers. Then there's a good chance that money will come back to premium publishers. Right. I think the the core stat that I always harp on is that Facebook and Google get seventy cents of every dollar in this ecosystem today, but they only have forty five percent of time spent, and it's not they don't get that disproportionate amount of spend because of their amazing ad formats and ad units. They get that spend because they have graphs. And they have tons of supply that's infused with this gra these graphs. So if we can do this at scale, we can provide the same option for the you know this trusted web of publishers that exist outside of these walled gardens. So our goal is you know when we think about all those custom audience budgets and campaigns that run within Facebook, our goal is to tip that and return some equilibrium to publishers outside of that, those walled gardens, so they can see their fair share of those budgets. So how long do you think this is going to take? Obviously, the other thing is, well, you, you see this as a, as a collective responsibility. You don't see this as just a index product. There's going to be others doing this, and it's going to obviously grow the pie because everybody's going to be involved. The more DSPs and supplier that are enabled, the better for everybody in the industry. Yeah, I mean, like we may be sort of the first uh, to sort of talk publicly about uh, this solution or bring forward this solution, but ultimately, the industry wins if we're all focused on identity. So it's really not about first or exclusive credit. It's really about scale impact. Um, and what we're really excited about is, is bringing this forward and making as many impressions as possible open and enabled for this type of technology. And that's why we actually announced our release of the identity library. So any publisher using Prebid can actually have all of these identity features enabled for free as well. All of these identity features used to only be available for Index Exchange wrapper publishers, but because this is such an existential threat uh, for the you know this trusted web of pubs outside the walled gardens, we said let's just make it available to everyone, um, whether your wrapper is pre-bid or whether your wrapper is is powered by Index Exchange. So we're absolutely focused on lots of graphs infused in real time into as much supply as possible. Right, Mike. Thank you very much. And, and, and this is going to be a big uh, multi-year product uh, project because it's not going to happen overnight. But obviously, it's the first step in addressing this big sort of uh, problem in our industry over identity. Mike, thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you. And um, we'll see you next time on Trade Talk TV.